Here is bright in the United States of America. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 10 tonight. Hebrews chapter 10. We appreciate those that labored hard throughout their high school years and to graduate. Even more than that, uh, if you graduated with a testimony of Jesus Christ, uh, all the greater. Amen. And so, uh, I'll ask you a question tonight. How's your EQ? Some people would say that's your emotional quotient, but tonight we're talking about your encouragement quotient. We're going to find out in a few minutes this evening what type of uh, encourager you are. Text Hebrews 10 tonight, 24 and 25, comes from uh, one of the most fascinating books in the New Testament. I've actually been teaching it out of the last two Sunday mornings in our adult Bible study. There's a lot we don't know about it. Sometimes we attribute uh, the author to Apostle Paul, but the truth is we don't know for a fact who wrote it and when it was written. There isn't uh, a whole lot other that we know about it from a historical standpoint, except that we have it before our very eyes. And uh, we don't know where the recipients were living. We don't know precisely what the circumstances are called forth in this letter. And there's this air of mystery that hangs over the book of Hebrews. One fact we are certain about, and that is the title, is the epistle to the Hebrews. The book was written to Jews who had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were Hebrews by birth and Christians by faith. And in that sentence is literally the entire story of Hebrews. They were Jewish by birth and Christians by faith. Man. To be a Hebrew uh, meant that they had entered into the way of the Old Testament. They knew the Torah. They kept the dietary laws. They sang the Psalms. They observed the feast days. They tithed their income. They read the prophets. They kept the Sabbath day holy. They were considered to be Jews from first to last. To be Christians uh, meant that they had heard, like you and I, and believed the gospel message. They knew Jesus now was the promised Messiah. They believed that the Old Testament now pointed to the coming of Christ. And when they made this step of faith, uh, they identified themselves with a very small, fledgling, little congregation uh, of Christians. It was not an easy step to make. Undoubtedly, they were uh, tormented by their family members and friends. Jewish friends accused them of treason. I know uh, that was the way my uh, wife's family and uh, her, when her father heard uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time, no offense to you tonight, but he said, uh, I was born a Catholic, I'm going to die a Catholic. And maybe some of you have said that same thing or whatever faith that you came from. And to be the first person to convert to Christianity uh, in a family, uh, you face uh, some peer pressure. You face some family pressure. And sometimes it can be very, very intense. And you can imagine in the Jewish days, uh, even to this day, uh, a complete scorn to a Jewish person who would convert to Christianity. Their families are constantly trying to get them back into the synagogue. Their faith was on the firing line every day. Compromise was easy, and convictions are very hard to hold. Spiritual warfare on a daily basis. And this is a context that this letter, or this portion of the letter, was written to them. Uh, some of them had already gone back uh, to their Jewish faith. Others were thinking about it. And for these Jewish believers in Jesus, spiritual warfare was a daily reality. They weren't, didn't have the benefit to shop online or just live out of their homes. They had to function in the marketplaces on a daily basis. Uh, their educational system, it's all public. And so they are absolute scorn because of their belief and their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's against that backdrop that I want to read out of Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 24 and 25 tonight. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. 
And let us consider one another in, good, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want to minister on a few good encouragers or wanted people of encouragement. One of the challenges of being a Christian in this day and age is you don't have a whole lot of people of encouraging you. And the Bible made it very clear uh, here that we read in Hebrews chapter 10 that they were spurring one another on. And so spurring is simply just kind of helping them to move forward towards love and good deeds and good works and goes on to mention, let us not give meaning together or give up meaning together as some are already doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If you read that in your Bible, that uh, letter D is an uppercase D. And we'll look at that and the reason why in a few moments. Uh, but the writer mentions a phrase, let us, three times. First, he says in verse number 24, let us consider how we may spur on one another. This means, literally this word spur, or consider means tonight rather, to fix the mind on. It's this picture of a radar screen, if you will, locking on to an object. So consider tonight uh, means we have to lock in uh, to what the writer is saying uh, and focus on something. Uh, and the idea of focusing on something tonight is to produce a strategy to obtain it. When we say focus, uh, or in Spanish, uh, enfocate, that simply means uh, we want you to lock in on something uh, with the idea behind it, how you are going to obtain it. We are to strategize how we may spur one another on to love and to good deeds. Uh, the word spur means to deliberately provoke. Uh, it's oftentimes used in a real negative sense when someone provokes their little brother or their little sister uh, or God forbid uh, somebody in the church would provoke uh, someone else uh, here in the congregation. Shame on you if that's you by the way. But in this context, it means to deliberately provoke one another to love and to good deeds. Secondly, the writer says in verse number 25, let us not give up meeting together. And so we all, we've heard that, we tell that to people, don't forsake the gathering of the saints. We tell that to Christians who aren't faithful in their Christian walk as far as church attendance. Uh, because we know tonight church is important. Man. It's important for a number of factors, uh, but in this situation, uh, it was speaking of, as well about this, uh, let us not give up meeting together, because that was the problem they were giving up. And they were challenged to go back to their old life uh, and forsake this Christian walk. Uh, and so part of this uh, is we're to encourage them uh, to stay fast, to stay true to the kingdom of God. But their synagogue friends uh, were challenging them to come home. And all, thirdly, it says, let us encourage one another. The third, let us. Encourage means what? To inspire, to continue. To inspire to the chosen course. To impart boldness or courage. When you encourage, E-N, you're literally putting courage into somebody. And you're speaking this, you're imputing this into them. Uh, and the Greek word translated encourage means the, the idea of coming to the aid or the assistance of someone else. This sounds like what the church should be. Put courage into somebody else. You can imagine somebody, a, a weary traveler, uh, sometimes you'll see this in the airport, sometimes in the hot desert sun, uh, someone is struggling. Uh, you'll see this outside our church, some of the ladies, uh, or even some of the their hands are full. Uh, it's hot, they're struggling, they're challenged, uh, and hopefully the first thing you want to do uh, is you want to run out the door, uh, you want to relieve the burden off of them, uh, you want to take the heavy parts, uh, put it on yourself. 
It's the same thing that happens if my wife happens to go grocery shopping or it's a Costco run or whatever it may be. I want to make sure I'm out there relieving that burden and taking that heavy weight and putting it upon myself. When we see someone struggling in their Christian faith, when we see them challenged, when we see them uh, uh, wondering uh, and the burdens of life come upon them, uh, that's the very time where we want to come to them uh, and we want to speak some words to them uh, that is going to lift them up. It's okay, brother. You're going to make it. Sister, I know uh, life is really difficult. Or you might not even have to say that. You can simply say, you know, let me help you carry some of the weight here. I'll help you make it. Together we're going to walk down this path. This is the idea of church tonight. Uh, we are people from different walks and different places in life and different cultures and different ethnicities and, and different uh, uh, generational ages here this evening. Uh, but we are to help one another uh, make it for Jesus Christ. That's the great blessing of the church uh, is we can cross uh, ethnic lines, racial lines, educational lines, economical lines, uh, and we can partner together for Jesus Christ. Uh, what I want tonight is a few good encouragers. It's coming alongside a person to help them in the moment of need. And uh, another area I wanted to look at uh, is uh, the need for a few good encouragers. It's really easy to be negative tonight. It's really easy to fall into that trap. Uh, but being an encouragement to somebody is fundamental to the Christian faith. We need this because everybody has a hard time. Everybody has a struggle. Everybody faces an adversary. Everybody faces a sinner who will come against them. Uh, people facing internal problems, their own family, financial, medical, uh, so many things. There's a lot of despair in the world. Uh, and the reason I'm preaching this very basic message is because we need a few good encouragers. Some people are so negative, they are never happy about anything. Come on. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you've all heard the story about the monk who entered into a very strict monastery. It was a very basic place, very spartan concrete floors and, and cold uh, 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 biscuits in the morning. Uh, I mean, everything was designed uh, to be minimalistic. One of the rules that the monks had was they had to keep absolute silence. Uh, they could only speak two words every five years. I can go there with a joke, but I'm not. Amen. <laughs> One monk coming up on his first five years uh, stood before the leader there, and he asked him, you've done great for these past five years. What are your two words? He said, food bad. <laughs> He had kept silent for five years. Superior blessed him, and he went back to his work. Five years later, his review comes up again. The superior asked him for the two words. He said, bed hard. His superior blessed him and sent him away. Five more years has come along. And the superior asked again, what are your two words? <laughs> I quit. <laughs> <laughs> the superior said, that doesn't surprise me. You've been complaining ever since you got here. <laughs> we all know people like that. They may be fine most of the times, but if you talk to them <coughs> long enough, they're going to start complaining. Oh, yeah. So how important is it to be an encourager tonight? Great novelist Mark Twain said, I can live for a week off of one compliment. Uh, I like that. And if you've ever been in the house of God and somebody's giving you one compliment at the right time, I promise you, you can live for a week. 
and maybe that's underselling it. George Adams said encouragement is the oxygen of the soul. Japanese proverb uh, says that one kind word can warm three winter months. I do believe it. I do believe it. Perhaps you've heard these words. If you treat a man as he is, he will stay as he is. But if you treat him as he ought to become and could, he will become that bigger and better man. Amen. Say amen. <laughs> it strikes me as an entirely true statement. People become what we tend to think them to be. They either live up to our expectations or they live down to our expectations. He'll never ever make it his dad is, you know. That runs in his family. He stumbled, yeah, his family, they're all drums. They're all hypes. They're all violent. And we have a tendency to become what people think we are, especially if they speak at all. Parents, you always have to speak future hope, blessing, positivity into your children. You're just like your dad. That's great if your dad was a good guy. <laughs> That's why you tell a job. You can do it. Pretty soon they believe they can do it. I mean, that goes true for an adult as well, too. I've looked at people, and everyone who's ever pastored or anyone who's ever worked with people in here before, male, female, younger and older alike, you know, if you let them know long enough, I believe in you, I trust you, I have confidence in you, somewhere that will actually begin to stir up inside of them, uh, and then they will begin to do some good things. How many believe that tonight? I really do believe it. You treat a friend as an enemy, it won't be long before he will be an enemy. If you treat a person as a criminal, he'll prove himself by robbing you blind. It's just the way life works. We have a desperate need for a few good encouragers. Yes. Thirdly tonight, there's the encouragement test. And that's the last part of Hebrews 10.25. Let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. And the translators took that word day in the scripture and they made the D an uppercase letter. And so why did they do that? Because that day, that day that is approaching, it's undoubtedly the day of the Lord's return. So how will they see it that day approaching? Jesus described the signs of the last days in Luke 21. You can read that. And he gave this exhortation in Luke 21, 28. Uh, when these things begin to take place, stand up and look up. Lift your heads because your redemption draws near. What are these type of things? Uh, these type of things that he's speaking about uh, are the great shifting of man uh, and nations that Jesus talked about in the last days, in the days leading up to our Lord's return. Uh, the world is going to be plunged into unprecedented turmoil. It's really close to that. Yes, it is. I often say we are the most educated and wealthy generation that's ever walked upon planet Earth, yet we cannot solve the fundamental issues uh, of humanity in life. Uh, and that is uh, because uh, that is not the answer to the fundamental issues of human life. Uh, that's a relationship with Jesus Christ that you can only find uh, in a place like this tonight called church. We desperately need some people that can encourage some folks and say, listen, uh, Jesus Christ is coming soon. Yes, that day is all around us. Uh, we have the ability to move globally like uh, unlike ever before. Uh, nations are changing before our very eyes. In the last 20 years, nations change. Some nations crumble. Uh, some people absorb new nations. Uh, it's the most unbelievable thing. Uh, and the thought is uh, Jesus encourages his followers. Uh, examine the word of God for the sign of his return. And let me make this stronger. Jesus expects us to watch for his return. It's an expectation. 
It's also an intellectual term uh, that we are to watch the signs. If you have an automobile, typically it's got a dashboard with all sorts of lights on it and some gauges. And the whole idea is there to tell you uh, the, your, your tire pressure is low, you're running on oil, uh, low on oil, you're overheating, uh, you're low on fuel. There's a check engine light that can tell you a number of things that's wrong with the computer uh, that reads all the sensors in your car. And Jesus says strongly, we're to watch for the signs of his coming. We already know because we hear this all the time, the word of God, uh, but these readers uh, in Hebrews, uh, they were tempted to turn back to their old way of life. That's why this was written. And that's why we have church. One of the great many reasons is we can hear the word of God, which is the life, which is truth, which is the bread of God. It's our hope. It's our future. It's our destiny. It's our strength. It gives us a broad spectrum of insight into how God thinks and how the world functions. Uh, and Jesus expects us to watch uh, for his return because, listen, these people, the Hebrews, the Jewish people who converted to Christianity were tempted to go back. You're, there are people here tonight, you are tempted to go back. Battle rages around them. And the thought is that we can take courage. We can take courage. It's one of the great things about preaching, one of the great things about our prayer life, and brothers and sisters in Christ who will say something uplifting to you is you can literally take it. You can take courage, make it part of your life, and we know that Christ is coming soon and his return is not far off. And that makes a big difference when spiritual opposition rises. Mutual encouragement is absolutely essential. Don't get angry. Don't give up. The writer, as I bring this to conclusion, mentions two areas for encouragement in verse number 24. One of the areas he mentions is love, and the second area he mentions is good deeds. Uh, and if for some reason, he thought it was very important for the Jews that converted to Christ in those days uh, to find encouragement uh, in uh, the area of love and good deeds. Love always moves in the area of attitudes. You can tell if someone loves someone or something by the way they express themselves towards it, the way they communicate, uh, or how much effort they put into it. So love moves in the area of attitude. Good deeds move in the area of action. I love church. Yes. 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 I love and guard my relationship with Jesus Christ. It's important to me. But I also am encouraged on good deeds. And sometimes we look at good deeds in a negative way, but it's called good deeds for a reason. They're good. That's the action part. During the battle when the shots are flying and your mind is swirling and life is not turned out like you hoped it would or thought it would, when we're under tremendous pressure, we're always faced with two great temptations. The first is to get angry. The second is to give up. Love helps us not to become angry. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This literally helps in anger. If you really love someone, it is a great deterrent for anger and hatred and bitterness. And even with all that, it still tries to rise up against you. Good deeds, I find, at least for me, help me not to give up. Amen. Some will say, you know, why, why are you so busy at church? Well, there's a number of reasons. We've got a big church, and we have a lot of things to do. Yes. Amen. We have a big world, and there's a lot of people to reach. Amen. 
We live in the last days when it is dark and dreary and negative, and people uh, need church so they can be encouraged, so they're not always dark and dreary and negative. Good deeds help in so many areas. It helps us not to give up. When you help someone by doing a good deed for them, there's a great blessing that comes. And the side benefit is it really helps you not to just bail, to quit, to give up. So we're to find ways to encourage each other in the very areas we need help in the time of crisis. Love and good deeds. We're to find ways to say, you know what? Don't get angry and don't give up. This is what encouragement is all about. Encouragement ultimately is about don't get too angry and don't give up. That's a ministry for every Christian. You want ministry? That's a ministry for every single person. There's not one person that walks under the name of Jesus Christ that sits under this voice tonight that cannot look at someone and say, you know what, something as simple as you're going to make it. I don't know all that's going on, but I believe in you, and I know God knows what's all going on. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar. You don't have to be a biblical expert to look at somebody and encourage them. That's something we can do tonight. It's something we can do tomorrow. So let me give you a quick test and then we're going to pray. Do my words of encouragement outweigh my words of criticism? Mm. Would those who know me best consider me a, an encouraging person or a really pessimistic person? Do I pass along good news and swallow the gossip, or do I pass along the gossip and swallow the good news? Do I focus on the positive qualities of people? And I know people have me. You know what? You can be positive to someone and then address the negative issues. You can really talk to someone, and I have, and I said, listen, I believe in you. Here are some areas that we need to address uh, that will help complete the picture of who Christ wants you to be. Can I think of someone tonight who needs encouragement right this minute? Have I been diligent to encourage those that are closest to me, my wife, my children, my friends, my students, my closest friends? Helping people feel important is something every CEO learns. Every supervisor should learn how to encourage somebody. You know, they said for years, back all the way back in my generation, it's a jungle out there. You know, it's still a jungle out there. If you feel the slightest inkling or urge to encourage someone, do it right on the spot. Don't hesitate. The more you encourage others, the more you are encouraged. The way to get more is to use what you already have. It increases by giving it away. You want to be encouraged? Give your courage to someone else. And God will begin to refill it. The more you'll receive by helping others, you help yourself. By strengthening others, we are strengthening. By lifting up someone else's load, uh, your load becomes lighter. Have you figured that out? It really does happen and it works. It's like the miracle uh, of the loaves and the fish. The more you give, the more you have, uh, and you never run out. Uh, there's always something left over when you give to somebody. Christians must become great encouragers. Especially as the world is kind of spinning and hurtling out of control. And it is out of control. Very difficult just to even gauge what they're teaching our children in, in our schools. 
the intolerance, the names we've talked about in the adult Sunday school that are assigned to being a Christian, you're a bigot, we're a racist, we're intolerant, we're closed minded. I'm going to read this illustration and then we'll pray. There's a story told of a second grader boy who was trying out for a part in a school play. When the day came for the auditions, his mother took him to the school and waited for him to come out. She was, she was really nervous because he couldn't sing, he couldn't dance, he couldn't tell stories. He, as a matter of fact, he couldn't even memorize anything. She was really nervous because she knew that he couldn't act. So she was surprised when he came out 45 minutes later with a big smile on his face, and she asked him, how did it go, honey? He says, it was great, Mom. Guess what? I've been chosen to clap and to cheer. <laughs> and some people might think, oh, what a sucker. I don't think so. Somebody knew the art of encouragement. So much so, this becomes a story that some guy is reading here across the platform years after it was written. The truth is, that could be said of all of us. We've been chosen to clap and to cheer for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I'm still appreciative when someone says something nice to me or to my wife. And I know if that's true to me, I know it's true of you this evening. They really do need to hear it. And we really do need to give it. Wanted a few good encouragers. Can we bow our heads tonight? Close our eyes. <coughs> Amen.